2021, a surprise contender won the Oscar for Best Documentary, a Netflix sensation that became a word-of-mouth hit. It's the story of Craig Foster, a man recovering from stress and overwork who decides to spend his days free diving in the ocean near his South African home. When he finds an octopus living in the kelp forest, he's instantly enamoured and decides to visit it every day for a year. The resulting film stole the hearts of audiences around the world. And it's no wonder. From a tense chase scene with a shark to a strut along the ocean floor, the documentary contains some of the most stunning footage ever captured of an octopus in the wild. But not everyone was won over by the story of Foster and his Octo friend, citing points in the film in which he clearly projects human motivations and needs onto the cephalopod he's supposedly so keen to learn about. When he returns to her den, he imagines that she's waving to him like a friend. It's like a and a human friend, like, waving and saying hi and excited to see you. Footage of her playing in a school of fish is presented directly after this comment. Each moment is so precious because it's so short. Implying that octopuses are living for the day because they're somehow aware of their short lifespan. And he describes octopuses dying after giving birth as sacrificing themselves for their children. Here's a... Uh invertebrate, essentially a mollusk, sacrificing her own life for her young. Clearly a forced attempt at making octopuses seem selflessly noble, while neglecting to mention far less friendly facts, like that they've also been known to strangle and eat their male sexual partners. More concerningly, Foster not only anthropomorphizes, but inserts himself where he perhaps should not be centering himself in both the frame and the story. At one point, he startles the octopus out of her den, and she swims away, never to return. But he's so desperate to see her again that he spends a week stalking her to her new home. Another time, he allows her to climb onto his hand, and then floats to the surface for air, which surely exposes her to the many predators all around but Foster presents it as an uncomplicatedly positive moment of human-animal bonding. He convinces himself that she reciprocates his happiness to see her, highly unlikely since he admits he not only obsesses over her every waking moment, but dreams about her as well. And perhaps most ludicrously, he finds a way to compare her having a limb ripped off in a vicious shark attack to his own midlife crisis. I felt very vulnerable, as if somehow what happened to her had happened to me in some strange way. And then this almost felt psychologically like I was going through a type of dismembering. And it gave me a strange sort of confidence that she can get past this incredible difficulty. And I felt in my life I was getting past the difficulties I had in a strange way, our lives were mirroring each other. Throughout the film, the octopus's natural curiosity is interpreted as a desire for friendship and human company, as invitation, as waving hello. It's not that all these assumptions are definitely false, it's that they're made with an ease that seems careless. As an experienced nature documentary filmmaker, Foster should know better than to let his biases drive him to make unsupported presumptions about a creature he knows so little about. To give him his due credit, he's obviously not an uncurious guy. His encounters are filled with genuine awe and interest for this life form that scholars have described as the closest thing we'll ever come to meeting an intelligent alien. Then again, this is the quote he chooses to open the film with. A lot of people say an octopus is like an alien. But the strange thing is, as you get closer to them, you realize that we're very similar in a lot of ways. Which begs the question, 
Is it possible to love and respect a creature without convincing yourself it's just like you? Could Foster have just appreciated this animal's strange beauty without having to weave a story about how her arm getting ripped off is actually exactly like the time he felt burned out at work? That the times she explored his body with hers is proof that she loves him back? I'd like to pause for a moment and acknowledge that this is a really tricky thing to criticise, because these narrative techniques are the same ones that have led to the film's incredible power and popularity with audiences. On the one hand, many found the intimacy of Foster's personal story moving and inspiring. On the other, it's the same intimacy that presents a problem. Foster could have made a documentary about an amazing octopus and all the ins and outs of its fantastical life, but by his own design he places himself at the centre of the story, both figuratively and literally. His physical encounters with the octopus are lingered on while sentimental music plays, underscoring these as important moments, which I'm sure they were for him. It's not a matter of saying the film is bad for doing this, but rather noting that every narrative choice has drawbacks that are worth mentioning. Arguably, Foster did nothing wrong here, as he insists that all the physical interactions were initiated by the octopus herself. But there remains a question as to what message viewers will take away from the film. As any experienced scuba diver will know, Touching marine life can harm both the diver and the animal in all kinds of ways, hence the common scuba saying, take only photos, leave only bubbles. And when humans mistakenly get the idea that wild animals are our cuddly buddies, it tends not to end well for the human, and even less well for the animal. To its credit, the film closes with an important and earnestly delivered message about the preciousness and fragility of ocean life, and all life on Earth. That is undoubtedly what many have taken away from the film, including a newfound appreciation of the octopus as a complex and intelligent creature. But it could also be said that there's another implicit message floating within my octopus teacher, one that can be found in the they're just like us framing, the uncritical projection of human traits onto the octopus, the centering of Foster's own life story and physically intimate encounters with the octo. That is, that the wonder and value of wild aquatic creatures lies in their proximity and similarity to us, their ability to cuddle up to us and help us negotiate our midlife crises. My unease with my octopus teacher is summarised best in an article by Kaylee Donaldson. It's more palatable for us to imagine that an octopus loves a human, than for us to accept that they should never have to even encounter one another to be worthy of our respect and awe. Abzu is a game developed by Giant Squid and released in 2016, and it's unquestionably one of the most astoundingly gorgeous aquatic games ever made. It's an undersea quest in which you control an amphibious android, bringing dead ecosystems back to life and saving the ocean from destruction. Everything about Abzu is intricately crafted to give you as much wonder and beauty as your eyes and ears and heart can handle, and there's a lot of it to go around. The visuals are spectacular, the textures smooth, the colours dazzling. Austin Wintory's score plays much the same role as the music in My Octopus Teacher. It's light, orchestral, inviting you to be amazed and uplifted. Many of the trappings of underwater game design are missing. There's no oxygen management, no danger from predators, and very little challenge. Abzu is calming and meditative and absolutely friction-free. But there's a paradox here. This is a game about an underwater ecosystem in which a single human is never seen, 
And yet there's nothing in these waters that doesn't feel man-made, that hasn't been smoothed out for the player by distinctly human hands. Nothing here is ugly or unsettling. Nothing will sting you or bite you or be in any way perturbed by your presence. Fish have no trace of suspicion or self-protective impulse. In fact, they might even flit alongside you for a magical speed boost. Turtles don't hatch slowly and painstakingly, but spring fully formed out of a hole in the ground at your touch. This is ocean as playground, as amusement park, as virtual water slide where everything has been stripped of its animalistic messiness and only the glossy surface remains. Of course, unlike real world theme parks, the animals here weren't literally defanged or tranquilized into submission, but the impression remains of a manufactured wilderness for the enjoyment of the passing tourist who just wants to ride a dolphin. When you sit down to meditate, you can scroll between creatures and have their names displayed on the screen. This isn't an ocean. It's an aquarium. The story, what little there is of it, is no less superficial. Parts of the deep are dead. There's no explanation as to how they got that way. You save them by going into a magic portal and putting a magic bean into a magic bubble and instantly manta rays and sharks materialize and the biome is saved. Press X to bring life back to the sea. Obviously Abzu isn't going for realism, but there's something uncomfortable about the way it Disneyfies ocean regeneration. Dead zones are a real phenomenon. Areas of the ocean where industrial levels of pollution have reduced water oxygen levels to the point where life can no longer exist there. Our world is seeing an increase in these underwater deserts, and more are predicted unless we radically change the way we grow food and dispose of industrial waste. Even when a dead zone is reversed, which requires large-scale changes to industrial practices, some species can take decades or more to recover, and others will never return. In Abzu, the sea can be rescued in a matter of days by one good-hearted robot and its bag of magic blobs. There's a needle to be threaded here. Human efforts can make an important contribution to regeneration and rewilding, but this must be coupled more broadly with overall less interference in the natural world. A commitment to simply not touch the remaining areas of wilderness we have left. Preservation requires both action and inaction. And overemphasizing the first at the expense of the second risks centering humans in a story we need to be less, not more, present in. But video games and their inherent agency aren't really designed to tell stories about restraint and inaction, and so it's easy for them to fall into this trap of telling a story in which aggressive human intervention in nature is the only thing that can bring it back from the brink of destruction. The superficiality of Abzu's narrative contributes to this issue. The story is ethereal, the themes abstracted the events decontextualized. Your little body just appears in the water at the beginning of the game with no hint of how you got here. But something happened to this ocean, and that thing was probably us. Among bones at the bottom of the ocean floor, you find dangerous machines that shock you if you get too close, a vague representation of the destructiveness of humankind. But the threat is conveniently fuzzy, nothing more than red blinking lights and grey shapes. And all that's needed to bring balance back to the biosphere is to smash the pyramids that were destroying the sea in some unspecified way. That's all it was. It was the pyramids. And now they're gone and everything's going to be okay. I hope I'm not being too harsh. Abzu is a neat little game. But by design, it's a toothless experience. An ocean game that doesn't really feel like an ocean. 
An ecosystem that's as glamorized as it is sterilized. A story that oversimplifies the human threat to nature, as well as what's needed to fix it. One wonders whether it's possible for a game to capture Abzu's blissfully gorgeous ocean environment without sacrificing that potential for a more wild encounter. To capture closeness without violation. In the dystopian far future setting of In Other Waters, a game released in 2020, Humanity is exploring the stars for a new home, having trashed theirs. Xenobiologist Ellery Vass has come to an alien planet to find her missing ex-lover and former research partner. Although you spend the game with Ellery, you play as the AI that controls her diving suit and research station. When you're not running tests at HQ, the entire game takes place on the ocean floor as you pilot Ellery to ever more dangerous depths in her quest to trace her partner's footsteps and reveal the mysteries of the planet Gleaser 667CC. In Other Waters is not a game for those who want speed and spectacle. Every time you lock in a point to move to on the topographical map, Ellery's heavy-duty diving suit takes several seconds to glide there. Exploration of Gleaser is a steady and measured cruise between coordinates, accompanied by brief observations from Ellery about what she can see. A strong current here, a coral cluster there. It's a slow burn, but in that slowness lies an undeniable authenticity. The calm and quiet of the depths, the unhurried movement of the animal life, the measured pace of a scientist meticulously observing a new world. Your range of abilities is appropriately limited to moving slowly around the ocean floor and collecting samples, which can be analysed in the lab and new suit abilities synthesised, such as a brief oxygen or speed boost. In this sense, Ellery isn't innocent of using the life forms around her for her own ends, but here it feels earned rather than exploitative. For the most part, Ellery doesn't coax the creatures into doing anything they don't already naturally do, like emitting a high-frequency sound wave or producing a burst of oxygen. There's a sense in which she's working with nature rather than forcing her will onto it, and that she's able to do so because of her hard-won knowledge of how the ecosystem operates. Whereas Abzu's animals come pre-categorised for your ease and convenience, In Other Waters asks the player to find curiosity and joy in the slow and steadfast work of xenobiology. Thanks to Gareth Damien Martin's sublime writing and world-building, every alien life form is a trail of breadcrumbs for yourself and Ellery to pursue, beginning as a series of haphazard notes to be gradually built upon with every new sample and observation, and eventually blooming into understanding about how each species survives and functions within the ecosystem, often in symbiosis with other species. You might learn that the spores emitted by a fungal stalk are actually a complex form of communication or that two species that seem to cluster together are actually sustaining one another. Once you've made enough observations, Ellery will name the creature based on what she's learned about it. Spore catcher for the fast-moving spore eaters, slow mason for the polyps that trace patterns as they move across a surface. And once you collect enough samples, your final reward is a lovely sketch of the strange and beautiful life form. There's no goal beyond this when it comes to the optional task of collecting all the samples in the game. Getting to know the wildlife is its own reward. And the subaquatic wilds are, if not overtly hostile, then certainly not the cuddly sort. Tangles of translucent veils send electric shocks through Ellery's suit. Acidic brine pools do damage to her power systems and the toxic waters of the bloom constantly deplete her oxygen supply. Even when not dangerous, 
the ghostly forms moving through the silt are far from comforting. Pulsating eggs, chitin-covered stalks, bristling fronds. The breezy orchestrals of Abzu are nowhere to be found. Amos Roddy's eerily ambient score features discordant synths and unnerving reverberations, a tribute to the wonderful alienness of Gleaser's undersea world. Ellery may be the main character of the story, but Gleaser very much has its own agency. Eventually, it's revealed what Ellery's partner was here to uncover. Baikal, the resource-hungry Exoplanet Extraction Corporation, already came here decades ago, messed shit up and tried to make it disappear. They ran invasive experiments on the plant life, and the result was catastrophic. A microbial meltdown that flooded half the planet's entire ocean with toxic algae. But in a reversal of the anthropocentric hero narrative, by the time Ellery arrives, the planet has already saved itself. The oceanic ecosystem adapted rapidly to the threat, and the waters slowly started to detoxify themselves. It's not until the very end of the game that you realise Ellery's task has only ever been to find answers and bear witness to the fact that life continues, despite everything. She ascends from the abyssal plains in the final chapter, reassured that Baikal's destructive machinery is defunct, and that the ocean is recovering, thriving, without her help. In her final lines before the credits roll, she looks forward to the simple pleasures of life on her new home, stepping into deep blue waters every day like she used to when she was a child, before Earth's oceans became grey and lifeless. Just being here, swimming and documenting this world, is more than enough. In 1963, the Bronx Zoo ran an exhibit called The Most Dangerous Animal in the World. Underneath the eye-catching sign was a mirror. Lest we forget, humankind is the most dangerous creature in the world, despite our well-intentioned desire to reach out, to touch, to interfere with the natural world. Media that glamorise this kind of physical connection with wild animals can be beautiful and powerful, but it can also seriously undermine the fact that usually the best way to be kind to a wild animal is to leave it the hell alone. Despite how heavily I've criticised them here, I enjoyed both My Octopus Teacher and Absu, and would happily recommend them, with one caveat that the sea creatures they depict are not fully respected on their own terms, but to some extent are used to tell a story that centres people and the human need to be the hero of the story, even a story about the non-human world. And as a message of love and respect for the deep sea, neither of them really leave the shallows. The oceans depicted in My Octopus Teacher and Abzu have both been damaged by the meddling of humans, and yet both stories present more meddling as the key to saving them. There's also an uncomfortable objectification in the framing of these narratives. The animals they depict can't just be animals, they need to also be a teacher, a muse, an object of obsession a vehicle for father-son bonding, a fix for midlife crisis, a speed boost, a surfboard, a prop, a stage for you to dance upon. But if we truly want to foster respect for undersea life, we need to learn to respect its otherness, its mystery, its elusiveness, its ugliness, its hostility, and to minimise our own agency and importance. The prickly fact is that any principled appeal to preservation has to have respect and rights at its core, not beauty or friendliness. Because not all oceanic creatures are beautiful or friendly, 
and most of them certainly won't let you jump on them and ride them around like a moped, but they all sure as hell deserve not to be wiped out. In Other Waters is one of the few truly ecocentric games I've played, one that avoids the trap of narratively dewilding its creatures in order to centre human needs and ends. What makes it remarkable is the way it creates intimacy through distance. Through the eyes of a biologist, I experienced a deep curiosity for non-human life, a connection grounded in an intense and respectfully removed watchfulness, one that feels so much more quietly satisfying than Abzu's flashy escapades. The main narrative of In Other Waters ends with its credits, but that's not the end of the game. After the credits roll, you find yourself back at HQ, with a final diary entry that opens with, Now the real work begins. This is, of course, the never-ending work of research and observation. I rarely play games past the end credits. But to my surprise, I chose to linger for several more hours in the waters of Gliese 667cc, lovingly fleshing out this world and its strange and wonderful inhabitants. And despite the presence of a plot-driven main story, I can't help but feel that this is the real game. One woman floating silently through sediment and spores, building up a taxonomy of the species that live here, and uncovering the complex interconnected ecosystems of these waters. Less surprisingly, some of my favourite moments in My Octopus Teacher were those of quiet observation. Not just footage of the Octo, but the other strange inhabitants of the undersea world something that wouldn't be out of place in the waters of Gliese. Recently, Foster has released a jaw-dropping book of marine photography, a study in wildness. Like Ellery's sketches, which have also been fleshed out into a companion book, these photos feel like an acknowledgement that ocean life is wonderful just the way it is a reconception of the natural world that places it at the centre of the frame, where it belongs. Because undersea life should never have to encounter us to be worthy of our respect and awe. What's up? My buddy here would like you to know that he'd be really sad if you clicked away without liking the video, subscribing, and considering supporting me on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. Thanks so much for watching. See you next time.